Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me this week. And this week, I'm going to be talking and sharing uh, about a topic that's very dear to me and very, it should be very dear to you and very important in your life. And so come back and we're going to talk about it. How do you approach or how do you receive the promises and the blessings of God? Well, there's a way that's easy, very easy. So come back and I'll share it with you. Thank you again so much for joining me this week. When I was in Bible school, all of us in our class had to prepare a, a, a message or a sermon, minister the word to our class, and we would be graded by our classmates. And my topic was on the presence of the Lord. My topic was on actually the glory of the Lord, the glory of God. And for me, that's always been a, a, a blessing to talk and to share about the glory of God and it should be the same in your life because in the power in the in the glory and in the presence of God is the power of God and it's where amazing things happen in your life it's the place where transformation takes place and so the presence of God is it's 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 something that we as believers really should should hunger and thirst after and should go after with all of our hearts the Bible tells us that in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy and that his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So there's something about the presence of God that we as believers need to understand so that we can appropriate it, so we can have the presence of God in our lives. And so that's what I'm going to be looking at this morning. And we're going to start off first by looking at Matthew chapter 21. And it's about Jesus. He goes to the temple and he sees that they're selling doves. There's the money changers in the temple. There's business going on in the temple. The temple is cluttered with things that it should not be cluttered with. In other words, today we say the church um, doing things in the church that really shouldn't be happening or shouldn't be done in the church. And Jesus goes in and he makes a whip. And the word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 14, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So when we look at Matthew uh, chapter 21, verse 12 to 14, what we see is that business was going on in the church and and what 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 the, the business that was actually going on was the the people before um if they needed to if they wanted to make a sacrifice or an offering to god they had to have doves or they had to have goat sheep they had to have these animals and so what was happening is they were going right there to the church and they were buying this there was business transaction money exchange going on um, in the temple where um, the temple that really should have been a place of prayer was what was going on was business. So people would go there and buy their goats and buy their doves and whatever. Whenever they need to make a sacrifice, they would go there and buy the sacrifice and then present it to the priest. But that was not the way God intended it to be. And so Jesus comes and he sees this and it grieves him. It grieves him to see what was going on in the church. And so the word of God tells us that he got rid of them. He turned their tables over. The, the, it says he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And then he said, it is written. And this, what he's saying, it, it's reference from Isaiah, I believe chapter 56, around verse maybe seven or so. It says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And it says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And what I want you to see here in this verse is until the unrighteous stuff that was going on in the church, until that stuff left, the blind couldn't get couldn't get their vision, their sight restored, and the lame weren't able to walk. It wasn't until after he cleaned the temple out, after he got rid of all of the ungodly, unholy stuff that was going on in the church, 
It was only then that we see that the blind and the lame, they were even able to get there to him so that they could get healed. And the word of God tells us that he healed them. They were able to get into the temple. And when they came to the temple, the blind and the lame, he was able to heal them. Now, what does that say to us today? First and foremost, the, the first thing we want to so settle and solidify is the fact that the temple of God is no longer buildings made of brick and stone. The brick and the stone of what you have today is where people who are now the temple of God, they join together and they go to these buildings of brick and temple. But the presence of God, the house of God, is now the individual who has made Jesus Lord of their lives. So, look at this and let's take it from that perspective now if you need healing in your body what else is going on in you do you have forgiveness in you are you cluttered with unforgiveness are you cluttered with fear are you cluttered with doubt are, are those things controlling you are they the things that's directing and leading you well you got to get rid of those things so that healing the healing power of god that's already resident in you by virtue of the power of God, by virtue of the fact that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, you have to get rid of those things. You have to let them go so that the life of God that's already in you can start to flow throughout your body. Because remember, when it says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in our bodies per se. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, the life of God dwells in our spirits. The Bible says that we are spirits. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. So our spirits is the container for the power of God. Our spirits is the, contain is the container for the presence of God. And what happens is because our spirits are contained in this body, what happens is out of our spirits, life flows into and through our bodies. So you see, everything that you need, and when God made Adam, when God made man, everything that Adam needed was already in him. All he had to do was to speak it forth, just like God, to speak it forth and it would happen. It was already there because he already had the life force of God in him. But when he sinned, and that's what we're going to look at, the word of God tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says that he hid from the presence of God. But before we get there, I just want to read a couple scriptures to you. Found Verse 1 being found in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 and 35, because I'm talking about the presence of God. I'm talking about the glory of God. Now, when we talk about the the presence of God. We're talking about the environment of God. We're talking about where God is, who he is. We're talking about, you know, each of us carries a presence. Each of us carries a presence. Well, God carries a presence as well. The devil carries a presence as well. His presence is evil, but God's presence is powerful. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what his presence, what's contained in his presence. But for right now, let's look at these scriptures. The presence of God is the environment of God and the glory of God. I'm defining some things for you. The glory of God is the presence of God actually being, be, actually being able to be seen. Uh, so the glory of God is the ability is when you're seeing the presence of God. So the glory of God is the manifested presence of God. Now, God has always wanted to live amongst and with his people. He's always wanted to do that. And so when we look in the word of God, we find that there were two places where in the, in the Old Testament where we find uh, the glory of God or the presence of God resident, where the, the, the presence of God dwelt. We find there's the tabernacle. We call it the tabernacle of Moses or the tabernacle in the wilderness. There's the tabernacle, and that's Moses. That's what Moses erected uh, in, the, in the wilderness 
And God came down and he would manifest himself in the tabernacle that Moses built, that Moses prepared for him. And Moses prepared that tabernacle based on what God showed him. So the word of God tells us in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 and 35, talking about the tabernacle, it says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord or the manifested presence of God filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God has a presence. God has, God, uh, um, he, there's an environment. God has an environment. And so the word of God tells us, it says the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, why, how was Moses able to write this? Because he saw it. He saw the glory of God. And then in, in looking at Numbers chapter 14, verse 10, it tells us that, and all the congregation said to stone them with stones. And this is talking about um, Joshua and, and Caleb who came back with a good report. And so the people, they, there were 12 spies that went in, 10 came back with an evil report, two came back with a good report, and the people believed the evil report. And so when they heard the good report, they wanted the children of Israel, the, the, the people, to stone the two. Because the two were saying, let's just believe God. These people, the, the, the people, they might be bigger than us, but they are bred. God has already delivered them to us. Their, their, their protection is already falling down. And so the children of Israel wanted to stone the two, Joshua and Caleb. And the word of God tells us in, Ex in Numbers 14, 10, it says, Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. And what I want you to see there is the fact that they were able to see the glory of God. Now, the second place where we see the presence of God or the glory of God manifested, being able to be seen, is in Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built. And let's look at that. That's in 2 Chronicles. There are many scriptures, but I just chose a couple of them to look at. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 to 14, it says, Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So we see in the tabernacle in the all in, in um, Moses, the tabernacle of, I'm going to call it the tabernacle of Moses. We see the glory of God. They saw the glory of God. And we see now in Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built for God. We see here again also that the glory, which is the manifested presence of God filled. It says it filled the house of God. In other words, God came in and filled that house with his presence. So these are the two places uh, in the Old Testament where we find the word of God talking about the presence of God. Now, when we come over into the New Testament, when we look at the New Testament, what we find is that Jesus now comes on the scene and the word of God tells us that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The word of God tells us that Jesus was the word made flesh. The word of God tells us that Jesus was the tabernacle or the temple where God dwelt when he walked the earth. Now, again, as stated before, God has always wanted to dwell with man. God's plan was always for heaven to come to earth. It did, and it does. And it happens in his manifested presence, when his presence comes on the scene. Heaven's environment, God's environment can be perceived and experienced just like the children of Israel did in the Old Testament. And this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just be brutally frank and honest, when we go to church, 
What are we going to church for? When we gather together in the name of Jesus, he says that he is there. Well, how do you know? Be, you know, he says that he's there, but what about his manifested presence? How do you know when his presence is manifested? How do you tell? Believe it or not, there are people who've been going to church for many, many years who've never experienced the presence of God. And if you've never experienced the presence of God, two things, either you're living according to religion or you've not made Jesus Lord of your life. In other words, the presence of God is not dwelling within you so it can come out. So that's something else too that I'm going to talk about a little bit as we proceed. But if you're, you know, the purpose and the power of believers getting together is to have an encounter and experience the presence of God. And if you're not experiencing the presence of God, you are missing out on life. You are missing out on the best part of life. Because here again, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. When you've experienced the presence of God, even though you might be going through difficult times and you experience his presence, what happens is his peace just comes and overwhelms you. His presence just removes that doubt and the fear and the problems that, that want to besiege your mind. So the presence of God, the presence of God is a very powerful force in our lives as believers. And it's important for us to realize that the presence of God is to be experienced. Jesus did all that he did so that we too could experience the presence of God. His, man, his glory, the manifested presence of God, which is his glory. Now, let's keep going. What did Adam lose when he sinned? Think about it. In Genesis chapter 3, it tells us that when Adam heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, it said that Adam and his wife hid themselves, and then it tells us what they hid themselves from. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. That's what they did. They hid from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is what's so interesting, because Adam and Eve were formed and made and created by God by the presence. It was the presence of God that was breathed into Adam, the breath of life is what was breathed into Adam. So Adam was very much familiar with the presence of God. He lived in that environment because the word of God tells us that God came and he spoke to Adam. He walked with Adam in the cool of the day. So Adam had experienced the presence of God and that's what he lived in. Adam lived in the environment of God. But then when they listened to Satan, what happened is, and here again, remember the presence of God is his glory. The glory of God is his presence manifested. So when Adam disobeyed God and listened to Satan, what happened was he, the word of God says, for all have sinned and fallen short from the glory of God. So Adam actually lived in the realm of God where there was no time. Adam had no perception of time. Because he lived where God lived, which is in eternity. So he had no concept of time. He had, he had no concept of beginning. He had no concept of end. Because he lived in eternity. He lived in the now. And when he fell, when he sinned, the word of God says that now at that point is when time started to control his life. He lived hundreds of years but when he disobeyed God and he hid from the presence of God, that's the day that he died. That's the day that he was separated from God. That was the day that he, the day that he hid from the presence of God was the day that God, his, his presence was no longer um, the environment that Adam was comfortable living in. And so Adam and Eve, they, the word of God says for, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and Falling short of the glory of God. Let me give you a great illustration I heard a minister say one time. He said, this is what he said. He said, a fish, a fish, if a fish is taken out of water, 
which is its environment, it will die. Now remember, Adam lived in God's environment because God breathed the breath of life in him. God made Adam. God created him, and Adam was able to fellowship with God. Adam was able to have intimacy with God because Adam lived in God's environment. So just like when you take, if you take a fish out of its environment, out of water, it dies. Adam, when he sinned, he was removed from God's environment. And guess what? He died. And that's what happened. So let's keep going. So what did Adam lose when he sinned? He lost the atmosphere of heaven, which is God's presence. Now, Adam had died before God showed up. Because if you read in Genesis 3, 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Even before God came to Adam, Adam heard God coming. And what he did was when they heard him, they ran from him. They hid themselves. And it says they hid themselves from the environment that they were living in. They hid themselves from God's environment. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord when they heard him walking in the garden. So what they did, they hid from God's environment. And they were in, they, when God created them, they were created to live in that environment. So that's so important. The Bible says, and as a result of what they did, all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen from the presence of God. All have sinned and fallen from the glory of God. They fell from the environment of God. So let's keep going. Now, in scriptures, remember David? David was a man. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. David pleased God. David was a man who, had, who spent time with God. David was a man that had intimacy with God. And when David sinned with Bathsheba and, she, and, and killed uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, Nathan the prophet came to David and told him what he did. God knew it, and God told him what would happen to him. But this is what I want you to see. Psalm 51 is a result of David's sin uh, coming to light. It's a, a, a psalm David wrote from his heart when uh, the sin came to his life, when it, to light, when he realized what he had done, and God knew what he had done. And this is what he said in Psalm 51 that I think is so important and so critical. Psalm 51, verse 11. He says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me away from your presence. So David, for him to say that, that tells me that David experienced the presence of God. And so David now is praying and asking God to not cast him away from his presence and not to take the Holy Spirit, the precious Holy Spirit from him. Man lost God's environment to sin. So how, how is it restored? How was it restored? Because it is restored. Well, let's look at the word. And this is important. It's important for us to realize, number one, that the power in church and the purpose of church is to experience God's presence. You know, years ago, we used to go to church, and you ask someone, well, what church do you attend? They say, well, I go to this church. You ask someone, I say, well, because the word is taught there, because I get the word there. And let me share this with you. This is so important. The word is so important. You cannot live. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But also, too, what you have to understand is that the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, it's revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge of the word, it comes only by the Holy Spirit, illuminating that word to us. So how do you get the word to be illuminated that you get the revelation so that you can live the life that God wants you to live? By his presence, by coming into his presence. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So, but let me continue on. Why is God's environment, why is God's presence so important? Because in God's presence is life, is glory, is joy, 
it's satisfaction, it's confidence, it's strength. It, in God's environment, in God's presence, is the solution to every problem that you can ever experience under the sun in God's presence. And what happens is the word of God, you need the word, but you also need the presence of God. The Bible says that the true worshipers, they will worship him in spirit, the presence, and in truth, the word of God. So you've actually, to be a true worshiper of God, you actually have to have the two of them. You actually have to be doing the two of them, spirit, and truth. You've got to have the Spirit of God in your life, which is manifested by the glory or what we would say the presence of God. The Word of God tells us, and I'll read it to us in Romans chapter 8, because I'm now, you notice I'm now intertwining the Holy Spirit into the presence, talking about the, when I talk about the presence, I'm using also reference to the Holy Spirit. Well, in Romans chapter 8, it says in verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And then in Romans chapter 6, it says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So it tells us that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And then in Romans 8, 11 it says, but if the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So when we're talking about the glory, the manifested presence of God, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the precious Holy Spirit in his presence in the spirit in the holy spirit is where there's life in the holy spirit is everything you need and you need to cultivate a relationship with the holy spirit and you need to when you go to church you need to go to experience god if you're not experiencing god then you've not been to church and so i'm encouraging you experience god start to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God and come back next week and I'll continue and I'll show you some more things in terms of the restoration that we have so where we can experience God's presence and his glory have a wonderful week God bless you